Thanks for joining us for the building of Brownwood. In this episode, we'll have a chat with the Morris family. Mark, Jennifer, and Tracy reminisce about their days at the original Brownwood in Northern Michigan. All that and more coming up from the log cabin here at Paddock Square. Sit back, relax, because you don't want to miss a minute of our extended interview. As our new town, Brownwood, nears completion, it's so close that I can't find anything to lift, nail, or paint. So what I'll do instead is give you a special sneak peek. Come on, let me show you what's going on. I know what you're thinking, wowzers. Yeah, I know, I feel the same way. Well, now we're going to bring you a very special treat because we're going to go over to the log cabin at Paddock Square and we're gonna to talk to the visionaries behind this fabulous town, the Morris family, and get their memories of the original Brownwood. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit down with us and reminisce a little bit, go back in time. What are your memories of Brownwood? What made it such a special place? Brownwood started as a roadside stand selling honey. Um, our step-grandfather was a beekeeper and my father and his older sister, Marlou, would sell his honey on the road, roadside on East Torch Lake Drive. And our grandmother, who was quite the entrepreneur and, and had great ideas all the time, decided she would put a little shop in there and that became the honey house and that was the beginning of, of Brownwood. A car would come by every hour maybe. But they'd come for the honey. Um, but then Mary Louise added cards and they had a little soda machine on the front porch and people drive by and grab a grab a soda out of the, you know, the old fashioned kind where the cold water circulated and they just lift it up and it was an honor system, you dropped your quarter in. So it was mostly a souvenir type of a shop. So when they added these shops, they're then was the Honey House, the Grass Lake Schoolhouse, one room log cabin, and then the old stagecoach stop that became a country store. And then ultimately, um, when our family became year round in Northern Michigan, um, actually it was prior to that, our parents turned the old Brown family farmhouse into a restaurant. And of course, my, our grandfather, Harold Schwartz, and my father were both marketers. That's what they were in advertising. And so my dad put his advertising expertise to work and that's really the synergy of the entire complex and the marketing brought people from all over. I mean, 
people will drive hours to come to Brownwood. I think it got to be more of a destination because there was quite a bit of notoriety. There was a big uh, local story when the country store, which was a stagecoach stop about three miles down the road years ago, uh, they couldn't move it down the road because they couldn't move the power lines. So they decided to drag it across the ice on a spring day. <laughs> uh, and it fell through and that really got a lot of publicity and uh, of course uh, dad and uh, Mima, uh, our grandmother, would have gotten into big trouble if they didn't get it raised and salvaged. So they, they managed to get it dug out and got the tow truck dug out and um, that really started to, people wanted to come see that building. I think that really is what started to get it to be a destination. What job do you remember early on? My first job at the restaurant was in the kitchen. Um, I worked in the salad and sandwich area, uh, baked biscuits and made salad dressing, made salads, sandwiches during lunch, and I did a lot of the prep work. I can remember when the, uh, the, uh, the drain field would plug up, I always had, I was the guy that had to climb down in the, uh, <laughs> <He> fit. <laughs> I was the guy that had to climb down in the uh, little lift station that pumped the uh, sewage back to the back and uh, <laughs> unstick the valves and all those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I, I was the back of the house guy. I was a dishwasher, I think. That was my first job. I, had a, I was a little bit young, so I had to stand on a little milk crate in order to get the dishes on the, on the uh, proper shelves. My first job was actually not in the restaurant. It was across the street in the shops. I worked for my grandmother, Mima. And I was a cashier at the country store, but before the store opened, it was myself, and our grandfather, Clifford, we would be back in the kitchen. We made the cherry butter, the bread, the pies. So we did all the, the prep work before the store opened. Then my grandmother would come in. <laughs> Late. She, she wasn't the earliest riser. No, we'd have to tell her a family function was about an hour and a half earlier than it really was. By the time I was 15, I continued to work for them, but I wanted to be a part of what was really happening, the fun stuff at the restaurant. So I think my first job at the restaurant at 15, which was legal back then, I, I was a cocktail waitress. And the money was good. <laughs> Loved the money I could make. Because <laughs> we could start saving for cars and prom dresses and yeah. stuff like that that we had to buy ourselves. You know, one of the, probably one of the reasons why I liked uh, the tasks that I was given was because I was given them. I was like, it's okay, Mojo, it's time for you to manage the kitchen. That's what happened. <laughs> it, there wasn't anybody looking over my shoulder when it was time for one of the girls to do the front manage of the, house. the dining room or manage the front of the house. That, that, you know, it was theirs to do. It, it was ours to do. And um, so that uh, sort of helps you to learn to make decisions and, and learn what it means to make the wrong ones and what it means to make the right ones. And how to, how to treat people. Mm -hmm. We learned everything that we about what we do here today in that restaurant back in the 70s and 80s. But we're not talking about 40-hour work weeks, are we? Oh shoot, no. Oh no, 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 no. My dad always said to be in the restaurant business, you have to be in the restaurant, and that's the way he feels here as well. If what we do, you gotta you gotta be in it, and so it's it's 24/7 because you don't you don't know when something's going to be needed. Dad was always a stickler for consistency. Consistency in advertising, consistency in hours. You can't be open now and then not open because so you just ratcheted down the number of people that worked, but the restaurant was open. The light was always on. <laughs> he, he had us for slave labor. Yeah. Too, so <laughs> right. <laughs> pretty easy to keep the place open when you just send the kids Tips over. Only. How did yeah. you balance everything? Because you were going to school and you had other interests and you were in athletics and different things like that. He won't tell it himself, but he was a very good quarterback. And I enjoyed cheering for him. <laughs> she was a very good cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> we have a funny story about what our, our tribals were. It was the Bel Air Eagles. Mm -hmm. And we had an away game. And um, we were typically the underdog at Central Lake, but uh, my brother was, it was, I believe your senior year, am I correct, or junior? I think so, yeah, senior year, a long time ago. Anyway, away game, <laughs> five years ago. we end up winning the game, and they report the only injury of the game was my father, who broke his pinky finger slapping my brother on the back and <laughs> hit his shoulder pads, and to this day he has a crooked pinky finger. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. Yeah, that was, it was an exciting day. <laughs>
Now, Mark, you being an athlete, tell me how that helped you in the business world. You've always been very driven, very competitive. How did that translate into business success? I, I learned a lot more about what I do today playing uh, team sports than I did anywhere else, except for dad, mom, of course. I mean, they're great mentors, but yeah, that's uh, uh, sometimes you get thrown into those positions where you just have to make decisions. And if you get to meet uh, us or dad, as an example, the, if you want to get us motivated, just tell us we can't do something, we'll figure it out. There were times when you guys didn't know where the next dollar was coming from, right? I think probably Dad going broke the first time <laughs> was probably the best thing that ever happened to us. The farmhouse restaurant uh, was uh, uh, sort of left to the family. So when we went broke in Chicago, the only asset that we had left was, I think it was 72, I think. It was came, 72. Yeah, we, moved, we moved lock, stock, and barrel, everything that the bank didn't take. We uh, loaded into two U-Haul trailers and pulled them behind our cars and headed north. We've seen the lights flickering. Oh, yeah. We've had to sit around the table and decide who was gonna get paid this month. Wow. Yeah, more than once. People lose sight of that when they look at successful people, but that was, there were years like that, weren't there, where you oh, were yes, asking many years. to borrow money? And, yep. wow. Many, many yeah. years. But it was never really about the money with you guys, is the impression I get. No, no, no. Pro we're pretty project oriented. Folks. We are. In the restaurant business, you're always trying to serve the perfect meal, which you can't do, and uh, have give somebody the perfect experience. So that's the goal. Same thing in the housing business or the lifestyle business. You try to deliver the perfect product, and every day you keep trying to find a better way. So better way every yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's obvious you had a lot of great memories of Brownwood. If you had to pick just one. I think my favorite memory is something that happened almost every weekend in the summer months. You'd roll off the lake at about three o'clock because that was time to report to shift and you'd get all your prep work done and everybody's coming in together and you'd work till about 2 a.m. For me it was at 2 a.m. we'd get done. It was a hard day's work and the, the satisfaction of wow we did this and it was never tiring because you're getting something done and I don't know people really enjoyed coming to Brownwood they talk about it to this day in that area mm -hmm. and, and you glow when you talk about it job well done That's, yeah. that says it all how about you Mark you're a, when you're a part of making creating something that's special for people like that then that's uh, very rewarding very rewarding so I, I just think everybody in the world should have to not just have a job, but should have to earn a living making other people happy. That's interesting. Why do you feel that way? It's just been the foundation that we were all uh, raised with. I mean, um, we've, been, <clears throat> we've been service people, we've been hospitality people all of our lives by uh, trial by fire. And uh, everything that we learned in that restaurant is what we apply here today. We don't know anything about this business we're in. We know anything about the restaurant business. We know about hospitality. We know about uh, how, to, how to assemble a good team, how to keep the good people on task, empower them to do things. How about you, Tracy? Was it grabbing the microphone and getting up there and singing? <laughs> I've seen some of that footage. Dad said sing. <laughs> you know? Dad said sing. That's and right. we did. <laughs> no. Dad said cook. Um, yep. Um, boy, I don't know if I can. You know, it really was fun. I mean, I enjoyed it. That's the two things of our mother that Tracy got was the ability to sing Indeed. and to make things look great. Mark and Jennifer can sing, by the way, too. They just, <laughs> I'm not sure if we I'm just, just the only one who to. said yes, or, and they said no, or if I'm the only one who was asked. But, I, I and did Mark have, plays the drums. I did have a stint as a saxophone. drummer one summer. Yeah. Because yeah. Dad said, play the drums. No, he had another stint on stage. And then... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to get out of this one. Lions Club, didn't you do uh, a little oh, benefit? I, 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 at, I yeah. did have mm -hmm. a stint on stage. He was Geraldine, Flip, he was Flip Wilson as Geraldine. <laughs> I won. Wow. He won. Oh, I'm I won. sure you <laughs> did. It was great. Does any footage exist of that? 
Uh, if it is, I hope it's burned up. <laughs> you guys obviously had a lot of fun. We had a jingle There's at Brownwood, just like we have a jingle at the Villages. Let's hear the Brownwood jingle. <laughs> ting, 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 ting. <laughs> That's Tracy. She's the singer in the family. <laughs> we'll be the background. <laughs> I'll be, we'll be the go Looking for good times. <laughs> for a fun time destination, Brownwood makes it great. Three Looking for good times, Brownwood is it. Where good friends gather for a great time. Now we can't tell the Brownwood story without mentioning some of the unique advertising that was done. In fact, the ad campaigns were so special that they drew thousands of people to the original Brownwood in northern Michigan. And we dug deep into our video vault to find one of those ads and share it with you now. Enjoy. Looking for good times. Getting together. Brownwood is it. Looking for good times. Good, good and fun times. Brownwood is it. Brownwood, the place for a full day of good times. For a fun time combination. Brownwood makes it great. Looking for good times. Brownwood is it. Brownwood is it. Brownwood is it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this month's V-Mail as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. And you'll want to be sure to watch next month's V-Mail because we'll continue our intimate chat with the Morris family. Mark, Jennifer, and Tracy will talk about the original Brownwood and what brought them to the villages. Plus, we'll have resident reaction about our fabulous new town. So you'll want to tune in. You may even see yourself. Thanks for watching.